everybody, this is Magnum Pi of Initiative Zero. As promised, we're going to give some behind-the-screen GM tips that are tied to each of the chapters in our new Chronicles of Darkness actual play, The Second City Chronicle. This time we're going to look at sandbox games and how world building and character and player and aspirations can really enable this style of play. As always, if you like this sort of thing and want to see more of it, hit the subscribe button. Tap the bell if you want to be alerted to new posts on this channel and drop a comment in the box below or find us on Twitter and Discord. The links are in the info down below as well. The Second City Chronicle is a redux of a game some of us at Initiative Zero played about 10 years ago. For some of our group, it was their first introduction to role-playing games. For most, it was their introduction to the world of darkness. It was linear. It had pre-generated characters, primarily to help people focus on learning the system and get immersed in the story. That said, it wasn't a railroad. Player agency was still directing the way the story played out, and it created a lot of fun times. A lot of the things that we kind of joke about and laugh about while we're doing our actual plays these days are, well, they kind of draw from the experiences we had back in the day when we first played this game. This new Second City Chronicle, though, it's more of a sandbox, and that makes things a bit more interesting for the players and for the Game Master. Let's talk about some of the reasons why I wanted to go in this direction. First, every GM has encountered a moment when they've prepped all week for the next game just to have players choose a completely different direction. Players will following their characters' goals and initiatives, seek out paths for their characters to follow that may lead them away from the adventure you've written. Dark Templar talked about this in our new Game Master Month video. He said 40-70% to 70 of what he prepped for the Gotham Chronicle didn't get played. In my experience, this sort of thing happens more frequently in very story-based games like Chronicles of Darkness. You don't often run into this problem in a dungeon crawl in Dungeons and Dragons, where a dungeon has a single entrance in a series of linked rooms. That said, you still could encounter it in that sort of game. I would just think that it's probably during the story-based components, where people have a lot of self-direction. In the sandbox, it kind of flips things around, flips the GM problem on its head. Rather than player choices for their characters leading them away from your prepared adventure, they lead them toward your prepared adventure. How do they do this? Well, we'll get to that a little later, but first you have to realize the most important part of a sandbox game is the world. The players need a box to play in. For the Second City Chronicle, the world is 21st century Chicagoland. That is to say, the areas in and around Chicago, Illinois. This makes things both easy and hard. It's easy because Chicago is a real place with labeled maps accessible via Google Earth and a whole history just already there for you to go and delve into. The hard part is that you need to set a fiction in a real place, and that sacrifices some of the reality, particularly if you aren't from that place. I am not from Chicago. All that I know of Chicago are the few times that I've been there and what I've read. Luckily for me, none of my players are from Chicago or particularly familiar with the city either, so the degree of suspension of disbelief required for my fiction is small among the players. Among you viewers, oh, I'm sorry for the Chicagoans who cringe when I misrepresent something in your city. But hey, I'd love to know more about Chicago. So if I do make a mistake like this, give us a comment about how it really is. That said, this is Chicago recast in a very dark world where the supernatural pull strings from the shadows and make it so, well, it makes it kind of different than what it actually is. That said, I really do like imagining that Elliot Payne saw a bloodied Albert Quay bust out a door into the alley behind the number 18 karaoke lounge and leap over the fence onto the southbound I-55 ramp. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go check out the first chapter of the Second City Chronicle. That little alley in the bottom right corner that you see now, that's the alley where it all happens. The world needs to be alive with different factions and non-player characters pursuing their goals. For me, this was also made easy. Th that book that you see there, World of Darkness Chicago, has all sorts of toys to put in the sandbox. It's completely mapped out setting. It's full of NPCs and locations and an alternate history, so that there's plenty going on in the world. And when I say mapped out, well, that's what I actually did. I went into that book and I took the things that they mentioned and I put them on a map 
so I can actually see it laid out in front of me. Now, that may sound like a lot of work, it's the same with keeping track of what all of these different characters are doing in all of these places. In reality, though, what this does is it, it makes the locations in your world triggers for activities of these NPCs. It's presumed, and it has the conceit that they're going on all the time, but what triggers them is when the player characters get to the places where those actions are actually happening. For example, Golgotha chose the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago as a place of significance for Grayson Bridger, his character. Well, both the Oriental Institute and the University of Chicago are places of significance with the NPCs in the city. That makes it really easy for me to drop encounters in, so that when he does things in those locations, he interacts with the NPCs that are there. Those NPCs are busy pursuing their goals, called aspirations in the Chronicles of Darkness, and they do so whenever Grayson interacts with that location. But what if he never goes there? Well, let's look at Elliot Payne. Dark Templar chose for Elliot to be from McKinley Park. Now that's not a spot that I have marked off as being of much significance to the NPCs in my game. I could make a new NPC and drop them in there, that's certainly a real possibility, but I know my world, so I know what's nearby. NPCs are linked to locations, but you know what? They aren't static. People move around. I myself might live in the north end of my city, but that doesn't mean I never end up downtown. For Elliot, the McKinley Park neighborhood is right next to Bridgeport. The Bridgeport neighborhood has an active NPC in it, Karen Grasna. Rather than wait for Elliot to come to her, I brought her to him because she was nearby. There was a storm. They both needed shelter. So she happened to be at the shelter that he's at. If you watch through the first chapter, you'll see that I introduce a few NPCs that were already in or near locations that the PCs are at. Well, that's the case for most of them. The hard part is going to be Vahilo's character, Vinny. Vahilo made a really cool character, inspired by a real-life mobster. And I really wanted to honor his idea because that's really part of player agency. And it's a really cool idea. Players need to be free to explore their character concept. And, uh, well, that's particularly so in a sandbox game. As I said before, in Chronicles of Darkness, all characters have aspirations and that's their motivations. These are super important for a sandbox game, but I think that they're really important for players to write out in pretty much any role-playing game. Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition has these incorporated into it in a, in a fashion. They're your ideals, flaws, bonds, and personality traits that you select with your background. In D&D, you're rewarded for playing those out by a reward of inspiration. In Chronicles of Darkness, you're rewarded for playing out your aspirations and resolving them by earning beats. And that eventually provides you with experience. Selecting these aspirations, however, is something that players sometimes need some help with. In D&D, you choose from a list, although you can come up with your own. In Chronicles of Darkness, they provide some suggestions, but aspirations are ultimately supposed to flow from your character concept. If you watch our Session Zero character creation cast, you'll see that I coach the players to make sure that they're not selecting aspirations that will take them out of the game. I'm sure Teku's character, Christopher Sloan, wants to write, but aspiring to write a chapter in his next book is not going to draw him into the weave of the, the world and all the machinations of all the different characters that are in it. It's perfectly reasonable for a writer character to aspire to that, but it's not a good choice to be drawn into the game. And it is a game. With Vinny, his initial aspirations made sense, and they weren't such that they removed him from play. Except that in playing out a guy who doesn't like to get his hands dirty, Vilo unintentionally stayed away while pursuing his goals. Part of this is my fault. I started the game off on a Saturday in a snowstorm, and a lot of Vinny's aspirations really kind of had to do with the work week and probably better weather. The other problem is, is that at the beginning of this 
Chronicle, I'm really trying to bring the group together. And so I'm giving them a lot more of a push than I really should in a sandbox. Things should be a little bit more organic. The character's unifying aspect is Albert Quay, the missing person. But for some, their connection to him is only peripheral. For Vinny, I tugged on that connection a bit too hard, I think, because it kind of felt forced. And this can be a pitfall in sandbox games. There need to be scenario hooks that are enticing to the players that will bring them deeper into the game. Matter of fact, there need to be several scenario hooks that lead to the same place, um, the same scenario, so that they don't miss them. By the end of the first chapter, we worked out a couple of hooks for Vinny, though. There's the accident going on in Chinatown that involved one of his trucks, and that grew out of play naturally as he wanted to check in on his vehicles due to the bad weather recently. There's also the desire to track down Albert, which that was a bit forced, again. Still, the aspirations that Valhilo has chosen for Chapter 2 are pointed in the direction of these hooks now, so hopefully we'll see him drawing closer to the group as the story unfolds. Well, these are my musings on sandboxing. There'll be more to come as the game gets played. For now, let's sum this up with a bit of an analogy. In a sandbox, your adventures are like rocks in a stream. Players can't avoid them, even if they're really big. Sometimes they'll avoid them because they're really big and they can see them coming. The key is building a world that's populated with NPCs that also have their own goals, or in Chronicles of Darkness, aspirations. These NPCs are anchored to locations in your world, but they can move about. When players have their characters go places or do things that intersect the NPCs, this is how you draw them into the adventure. They get caught up in what the NPCs are doing, and that draws them in. There are also scenario hooks, and that's why it's really important to do the chronicle building part of a campaign. If you want to see how to do this for Chronicles of Darkness, check out Session Zero Chronicle Building. Well, that's all for now. If you like what you heard and want to hear more, hit the subscribe button. Let me know in the comments below what you liked, what you didn't like. If you want to know when more of these GM tips and other content on our channel will be posted, well, just hit that bell. Thanks for watching. The Second City Chronicle will continue this week with the next chapter of the Of Mice and Men story. It'll post on Friday. Until next time, remember that if you can't roll high, you can always hang with us at Initiative Zero.